So people with with thyroid issues can present with a whole host of neurological symptoms. I mean, people can be really sort of lethargic. They can have like this brain fog. Um, they can have memory problems. Uh, they can have numbness and tingling everywhere. Uh, so they can develop a lot of different neurological symptoms. Welcome to Let's Talk Thyroid, where we explore different aspects of living a healthy thyroid lifestyle, positively and practically, to help you thrive and not just survive. Join me, Annabelle Bateman, your host, and Let's Talk Thyroid. This podcast has been proudly supported by, well, me. I am fully backing my podcast and getting the Let's Talk Thyroid message out to you. If you are interested in purchasing essential oils, that is one of the ways that uh, you can support me and I can support you and essential oils can support your overall thyroid health and wellness. So if that's something that you would like to add to your health and wellness toolkit uh, of resources that you can access to support you in a number of different ways, send me a message. I'd love to help you find what suits your individual needs and budget. Or you can head to AnnabelleBateman.com and follow the links there to essential oils. But think digestive support, stress management, reducing your toxic load, all sorts of ways that we can use essential oils as part of our overall lifestyle approach to managing health and wellness. Raising awareness of thyroid symptoms is a really helpful way for people to understand that they might have a thyroid problem. And many of those symptoms uh, can present as neurological symptoms, things like brain fog, fatigue, concentration, inability to focus, those types of things. And so I was thrilled uh, to be able to have this conversation with Dr. Philippe Dion about brain and thyroid health. Dr. Dion is a, a board certified neurologist in the United States, uh, in New York, and he's really passionate about getting to the root cause of what's going on for his patients and then treating them holistically. So you're going to love the conversation that I have with Dr. Dion. If you want to check him out and the services that he provides, uh, he's got a fabulous uh, 30 day brain course. He's got a, a cool brain fit app and a book on neuroplasticity. So check out his website, which is Inley brainfitinstitute.com, I-N-L-E, brainfitinstitute.com. I'll put all the links in the show notes so you can connect with him. All right. Well, Philippe, welcome to the Let's Talk Thyroid podcast. I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Well, thank you for having me. This should be fun. So I'm looking forward to it. It should be fun. I have a lot of questions. So, <laughs> but I know, um, so we'll just launch straight into it. Uh, you're a neurologist. Uh, and so what, what is it that interests you about th that thyroid brain connection? Yeah, so I see people all the time that get referred to me for neurological issues, but the real issue is their thyroid. It's the impact that the thyroid is having on the brain that's causing their symptoms. Um, and I don't think people often realize that. I don't think they often do either. And um, I mean, for me, I've had Hashimoto's, I was diagnosed when I was 23, which is now quite a while ago. And about six years was diagnosed with a single episode of demyelination, like a big brain lesion. And it's only really been in the last six months or so that I've thought to connect that to the Hashimoto's. I just thought it was another autoimmune disease that I'd collected along the way, knowing that one autoimmune condition can make you susceptible to more, but I hadn't really made that connection. And I'm happy to go into that in a bit more detail, but can you just explain what the thyroid brain connection actually is? Yeah, so, so the thyroid is responsible or plays a huge role in your brain's ability to evolve from the time that you are in utero and certainly when you are a baby. But this also continues into adulthood, right? In order for you to have a very healthy brain, you need to have your thyroid functioning properly. And the reason is that the thyroid does several things within your nervous system. First, having a, a normal functioning thyroid allows your cells to differentiate into the cells that they're supposed to be, right? So whether they're going to become neurons or whether they're going to become glial cells, 
It also plays a huge role in where the cells sort of migrate to throughout your brain and making sure that that, that normal migration pattern um, is a healthy one. You mentioned that you, you've got a demyelinating lesion. Well, having a normal functioning thyroid plays a huge role in myelination. And for people don't, that don't know what myelin is, so myelin is this like fatty tissue that wraps around uh, part of your neuron, the, the axon, the part of the neuron that sends electrical information from one neuron to the next neuron. And what the myelin does is that it allows the electrical signal to travel incredibly quickly. Right? So instead of the electrical signal traveling slowly, the, it essentially jumps from one area of the myelin to the next. Right? And that allows it to travel really fast. It allows neurons to communicate really quickly. It allows us to think really quickly, move really quickly. And so when that myelin starts to break down, we often see people develop neurological symptoms. And, and one uh, disease that's really associated with demyelination is multiple sclerosis, right? Well, so it's thought that myelin does, a, uh, or, or thyroid does a couple of different things when it comes to myelin. That first, when we're really young, when we're neonates, when we're babies, that it plays a role in really causing the cells that make myelin to work properly. But as we get a little bit older, as we get into adulthood, what it's really thought to do is that having a normal functioning thyroid allows neurons to mature in the way that they're supposed to. And once it hits that sort of maturity, that's when it, it, it triggers myelination to take place. And so, so no, go ahead. I was going to say, what does, is, is when you say it reaches maturity, is that an age or a developmental stage? Does that mean like adulthood or what do you mean by that? So it's really about, um, the, the axon of the neuron, how long and how thick it gets, right? It's got to it's got to reach a certain thickness for for it to be able to be myelinated. It's got to reach a certain length for it to be myelinated. Okay. And so the thyroid plays a huge role when it comes to that, in, in terms of how neurons are evolving. And and is that an ongoing process, sort of throughout your life? Yeah, so we used to think that we were born with a certain amount of neurons. And as we get older, the only thing that could potentially happen was that neurons would just die um, as we got older, or maybe we got a brain injury and we'd lose some. Now we know very differently. We know that we're constantly making new neurons as long as we're giving our brains what it needs. We know that our brains are capable of not just making new neurons, but also healing um, from injury. So... And we call that neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to make new neurons and new connections. And so having a normal functioning thyroid plays a huge role in neuroplasticity. So then if you've had a thyroid that hasn't been functioning well for a long period of time, that would have quite a significant impact then on the myelination process. Is that right? Absolutely. And we see that manifest in a lot of different ways. So people with with thyroid issues can present with a whole host of neurological symptoms. I mean, people can be really sort of lethargic. They can have like this brain fog. Um, they can have memory problems. Uh, they can have numbness and tingling everywhere. Uh, so they can develop a lot of different neurological symptoms. I hear a lot about and have experienced things like, you know, brain fog, lack of concentration. Um, I mean, one of the questions I want to get to is, you know, whether, whether we actually, do we lose brain function, you know, as we, as we go along. Um, but yeah, there's so many, seems so many symptoms that I've always understood as Hashimoto, you know, Hashimoto symptoms or underactive thyroid symptoms that, that are brain connected. So do you see, tend to see people knowing that they've got a thyroid condition, like as in do your patients come to you and they think they've got a neurological issue or they think they've got a thyroid issue that has neurological symptoms? No. So they always think that they've got an underlying neurological issue. Uh -huh. and, and sometimes, and, and usually depending on what they present with, we're always ordering um, TSH to, so to assess the thyroid function. If somebody's coming in with any memory issues or cognitive impairments, TSH is one of those standard labs that we send, send off. Somebody's coming in with neuropathy, so damage to their nerves, numbness and tingling. TSH, again, is one of those things that we tend to send off. 
But sometimes people will come to me for neurological issues and I take a look at their history and I'm like, wow, your thyroid is way off. Like this is all because of your thyroid. And so somebody I saw today who uh, was sent to me for numbness and tingling in her feet and she's got really bad numbness and tingling in her feet. And this is actually her, the second time I'm seeing her. I saw her a few weeks ago. Um, and so when I saw her then, she had a TSH of 28. And I said, look, you know, I can give you medications, you know, to help you with some of the, the, the pain and the tingling that you're having. But the real problem is your thyroid function, right? And so you've got to get that under better control. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's interesting. So really you're diagnosing a whole lot of thyroid issues. Yeah, absolutely. As a neurologist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and sort of re, sort of confirming that, look, this is a thyroid problem. Yes, it has a neurological manifestation, but this is a thyroid problem. And that's the case with a lot of neurological diseases, actually, that the, it's, it's a manifestation of some under, other underlying issue that's going on. Yeah, look, the more I learn, the more it seems that thyroid just really does sit behind. <laughs> it feels like everything. <laughs> I'm sure there's something it doesn't sit behind, but it feels like it sits behind pretty much everything. Yeah, well, it, it controls uh, the way that your body utilizes and stores energy. And that's every aspect of the body. And it plays a huge role in the development uh, of different organs. And that's, that's true, especially when it comes to the brain. And, and Philippe, does it play out differently if you have, say, an overactive thyroid or an underactive thyroid? Like, do they present differently from a neurological point of view? So they can. So both hypo and hyperthyroidism can present with brain fog and, and concentration difficulties. Um, but some symptoms may be a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit different, right? So uh, there was somebody I saw not too long ago who had really horrible restless legs. And we often associate restless legs with iron deficiency, right? Her iron was fine, but she was so hyperthyroid that once we got that under control, she did better, right? So somebody else may present with neuropathy, so numbness and tingling, but her symptoms are a little bit different. Um, and so, you know, everybody's a little bit different, but certainly hypo and hyperthyroidism can present differently in certain circumstances. So say you have, you know that you have a thyroid issue and you're doing your best to manage it, but you're still experiencing neurological symptoms. When do you think you should see a neurologist? You know, when is it at the point where you think, oh, my brain fog or my concentration or my numbness or whatever is to a point that really needs that extra specialist attention? Yeah, so usually when people have neurological symptoms due to thyroid dysfunction, once you correct the thyroid issue, <clears throat> they tend to get better pretty quickly. And so if you've corrected the thyroid issue and the person is still having some problems, then they should certainly see a neurologist. Yeah, so it should go away. If it's being managed well, then it should go away. <laughs> what I always find really, really interesting is somebody will, <clears throat> you'll know that they've got a thyroid issue. They see a primary care doctor, an endocrinologist, and they haven't checked their thyroid function in a year or two. Mm. And I'm like, how is that even possible? <laughs> Apparently it is because I hear that yeah. quite a bit too. <laughs> I get mine checked every six weeks, so I'm trying to be pretty... <laughs> pretty on top of it. I think one of the things that I like about what uh, I've seen of you from your Instagram and website and all of that is that you're interested in the whole person and getting to the underlying cause and uh, discussing things like diet, and lifestyle, exercise, those types of things. Because from what I understand um, with thyroid, you can have a thyroid, even a TSH in a normal range, but still be experiencing some you know, some symptoms and some autoimmune response. So does diet and exercise and lifestyle come into it from your perspective? Yeah, so I think, you know, diet and exercise plays a huge role. And so one, different labs have different parameters of what's normal for, for TSH. But also when we talk about something autoimmune that's affecting the thyroid, well, it means that your body is reacting to something in the environment. And so you need to figure out what is it that it's reacting to that's causing the body to attack itself? 
And a lot of times that'll be in the foods that we eat, uh, something we've been exposed to. And so you really want to try to figure out, well, what is it causing this person that's causing this person's issues to really help them get healthier? And so do you see common common things that they, they are, common foods or common triggers? So often see high carb foods, processed foods, foods that have a lot of gluten in them. These are the kind of foods that really trigger an autoimmune and inflammatory response. And so are they things from a, I mean, maybe even a general brain health perspective that we'd be better off avoiding? Yeah, if, you, if we can avoid carbohydrates and artificial sugars, that would do wonders, right? So we even see with things like Alzheimer's disease <clears throat> that one of the things that's associated with it is type 2 diabetes, right? So minimizing carbohydrate intake is incredibly important. If I was to come to you as a thyroid patient with neurological you know, issues, is there a particular diet that you would recommend or foods that you would recommend as being really, <clears throat> really great for thyroid brain health? So everybody's a little bit different. And, you know, it would be easy to say, yes, follow this diet. And a lot of times doing a really low carb diet is really important, right? So a diet like ketogenic diet or modified Atkins diet, but <clears throat> some people can stick to diets and some people can't. And so for some people, it's just about tweaking one or two things um, that they normally take in. So I had a patient once who had horrible epilepsy. She's had epilepsy surgery. She was on five different anti-seizure medications. She's never been seizure-free. All I did was take soda out of her diet, and she was seizure-free for six months. Wow. Wow. She started coming back into the ER. And so I was like, what, what's going on? And she was like, you'll never take soda out of my diet again. So she went back to the soda and was not having seizures again. Wow. So wow. It's not even a huge diet overhaul. It's really yeah. about finding one or two things that you can take out to really help them. Yeah, yeah. And I know you talk a fair bit about exercise too, exercise and brain health. Tell, tell us a bit more about that. And in particular, you know, as we relate to thyroid issues, is there particular kinds of exercise that we should do or not do? Yeah, so exercise gives the brain everything the brain needs to be healthy. It causes your body to release chemicals that create new neurons, new connections, promotes healing. And so the, the kinds of exercises that you really want to do are things that combine both resistance training and aerobic activities, and especially if you can have complex motor movements. So I grew up playing and competing in tennis, and so I'm sort of biased. So I'm kind of like, tennis is a really great exercise to do. Um, but just getting your body moving. So our, our bodies are meant to move. And sort of at the helm of that is our brain. And so you really want to just get your body moving on a regular basis. Okay. So how, whatever way you enjoy that. Right. So whatever way you enjoy that, as long as you're not getting hit in the head. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think if I was playing tennis, I might get hit in the head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to practice the moving around a bit, <laughs> a bit first. I mean, even it's just going for a walk enough. Cause I think sometimes in my experience is when I've done lots of high intensity exercise in the past that can cause a bit of a thyroid flare. And, um, right. and mm -hmm. so I, I suppose I've tended towards more, you know, your Pilates and yoga and going for a walk and maybe that's my excuse to not do all the really full intense stuff. But, yeah, I'm just curious, does that, is that enough? So there are studies that show that people who have, like, cognitive impairments, if they even start walking 30 minutes a day, that that's enough to improve their neurological health. And we do know that people who have demyelination, um, when you overheat your body, that actually slows the ability of neurons to communicate with each other. It slows down the electrical signal. And so, and that, that'll be in anyone. And so in people with demyelination, that's even worse now because they already have um, a slowness in the propagation of that electrical signal. So <laughs> we've just bought a sauna. So you're saying that's not such a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it depends. I mean, you know yourself better than anyone, right? 
but <laughs> but heating up. So that's interesting. I hadn't really heard that. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. one of the ways we easily diagnose MS is if somebody tells you, "I get symptoms when I take a hot shower." Hmm. Okay. Oh well, that's something I'll I'll pay, pay a bit of close attention to because we've just yeah just been enjoying a, a sauna before bed and it's been quite nice and relaxing and you know I feel like I've had good sleep. But I'll 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 pay attention to that. I, don't, I certainly don't want any more demyelination issues. So, no, I mean, listen, you know yourself better than anybody. You are yeah. the expert on you. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I'll work it out. Uh, and that's the thing, isn't it? It's so much of this lifelong journey is it is just figuring it out. As you say, it's working out. What's that? Is it the one food or the exercise or a trigger environmental toxin? Is that, you know, what is it that's, and it's all different for all of us. Yeah. Listen, when I when I I tell patients all the time, I may be the expert on the brain, but you're the expert on you. So it's two experts coming together to try to figure out how to get you healthier. I know one of the things you said right back at the beginning um, related to brain development in utero. And actually, I asked, I've got a Facebook group and I asked yesterday if anyone had any questions for you relating to thyroid and brain health. And actually one of the questions related to that, and it was, um, you know, does your thyroid health affect a baby's brain development during pregnancy? And if so, is that, how significant is that? It can. So if you're hypothyroid, so thyroid will cross the placenta and cross into the baby's blood brain barrier. And so thyroid is key for the normal development of the brain. And so if the baby is not getting enough thyroid, that can um, result in developmental delay and other neurological issues. So it's important to make sure that you th- your own thyroid is healthy during right. pre- before during pregnancy. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I remember I've had three babies. They all seem to be pretty okay now. <laughs> they're all teenagers. So they're different levels of brain issues <laughs> with teenage brains. But um Teenage brains is a completely different conversation. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we should have that conversation right. too. <laughs> yep, there. Yep. Let's not go there. I would take the brain of a seven-year-old over the brain of a 17-year-old any day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I think the 14 and 12-year-old at the moment are almost kind of have more challenging brains than the 17-year-old in our house seems to be, I don't know, creeping just out of the out of the depth of teenage brain. I don't know. The others, are, it's just, it's interesting having three of them and, they, and they're all boys. So they all go in and out at different times. You think, oh, that's right. That's okay. He'll come good again. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a, a different kind of question. Some of, something that I've found when I've been talking to other people on the show and people who are just sharing their own experiences of having a thyroid issue is the idea, there's sort of two parts to this question as to whether there's a metaphysical component and a personality component. And so the metaphysical stuff that I've heard is, you know, if you are the sort of person that maybe doesn't express yourself or holds things in, doesn't like to voice, you know, voice opinions that that can somehow impact on your thyroid sort of sitting in your throat and so it becomes this sort of like you're choked have you come across that idea? Yeah, so, so when it comes to, um, if you look at the chakras, so each chakra sort of represents a, a different thing. And <clears throat> I'm not so sure about the chakra that represents the thyroid, mm-hmm. but I know that a lot of times if there's some kind of health challenge going on, it could be related to, to relationships that you had as a child. Um, it can certainly be related to personality. Um, and so, you know, th- those things are really powerful. In Western medicine, we don't really learn about those particular things, but we don't have all the answers. And there are things that happen that are way beyond our explanation. And I think that metaphysical things are absolutely true. Yeah, it's fasc- it's, it is fascinating that. Yeah. Um, and the personality side of things, do you... I mean, before I sort of tell you what I think, (laughs) um, do you see a personality type perhaps uh, or similarities in people that come to you with thyroid issues? 
Not, not necessarily. I think it depends on the kind of neurological symptoms that they're having. So the way that the thyroid is affecting them, mm-hmm. right? So people who tend to have um, <clears throat> issues more with their, their brain, I find are a little bit more anxious. Whereas if it's more of a peripheral nervous system issue, they're, they're not as anxious, right? But it could just be related to that there's issues in the brain, you know? <clears throat> so here in the U.S., we have all these different subspecialties. We've got neurologists, psychiatrists, psychologists, all who look at the brain from different perspectives. But it's all the same organ. And so as a neurologist, if somebody has a structural change in their brain, they're also going to have some mood disorders and mental health issues because it's, it's the brain that's affected. So something that I've, I've found uh, in talking to people is that it, it feels like that that overachieving, highly driven um, kind of type A type of personality often tends to work, them, work themselves into the ground and end up with a lot of thyroid issues. I wonder if it's more hyper or hypo. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder. Or I wonder if that personality attracts that, that autoimmune, like it's that inflammatory response. And yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I know for me, so I'm 41. At 18, I was diagnosed with kidney failure. And actually at 28, I had a, a kidney transplant. When you look at the metaphysics of people who develop kidney issues, you can trace that back to maybe some issues that they had with personal relationships, especially in their younger years, and how close they felt to certain people in their younger years. And when I think back to my childhood, it it sort of plays out pretty accurately. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose that's the personal work that we've all got to do, isn't it? So if um, I guess if you're listening to this and you think, yeah, there is some personality issue or you're feeling like you're not being able to voice yourself, it's worth having a think about those. Maybe they are more psychological than neurological. Well, look, in, in my online course, one of the things that I talk about is the importance of developing yourself. You've, you need to develop your mind, body, and soul in order to truly uh, be healthy and overcome whatever health challenge you're facing. It's not going to just be in a pill. You actually have to do the work to get healthier. It would be so much easier if that wasn't the case, though. <laughs> and you must see it all the time, people coming to you wanting the pill, wanting the, the quick fix or the, yeah. the solution. Right, they, they, they want the pill. I mean, one good example is, look, I saw somebody recently, horrible neuropathy, horrible pain in her legs, numbness and tingling, not, you know, trouble walking. And she's like, can you give me something? And I said, sure but when's the last time you drink alcohol? Because she has a history of alcohol abuse. And that's the reason for her neuropathy. And she was like, two days ago. And I'm like, so if you're still doing the damage to your nerves every day, popping a pill is not going to do anything. We're just going to be increasing dosages. It's really interesting. So when I first went to see my neurologist for my brain lesion, um, I was offered some steroid medication as a preventative and I said oh look I really I really don't want to go on any medication unless I really have to I said I do I have to no no you don't have to that's your choice but he said the drug companies are recommending that um you know you go on that someone like you uh, and I think I was just 40 at the time uh would go on some medication for that long you know longer term preventative preventative and so I took the information did some reading and research and I thought oh I just I think I'm going to hold off I'm just going to wait and see and I went and I suppose dug deeper into the the diet the lifestyle reducing stress um you know I take a whole lot of supplements and use essential oils and a whole lot of those sorts of things and every year I've gone back and had another MRI and another appointment and no you know the lesions shrunk. I haven't had any further lesions. And each time he says, and you didn't go on any medication. And I said, I I didn't. (laughs) But you've got to understand, I haven't sat around doing nothing. (laughs) I said, I I do do a whole lot of stuff for my health. But, um, and it's been really interesting. So over that six year period, 
he said, you know, it's a good thing you didn't go on that medication because you would have had, you know, that period of time on steroids that you didn't really, didn't really need. Yeah. With, and it would come with a whole bunch of potential side effects. And I mean, usually we don't give, at least here, we don't give steroids chronically for any demyelinating lesions. We'll give it sort of acutely um, for the inflammation. But the reason that you give steroids is because it's a powerful anti-inflammatory. But so is changing the way that you eat. So is exercising on a regular basis. So is minimizing stress because stress actually kills neurons. Um, so doing those lifestyle changes is really important. And it sounds like you 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 did the work. You didn't just pop a pill. Uh, yep, I have done a whole lot of work in this space. But um, can we move on to stress and stress management and have a chat about that for a sec? I discovered your app yesterday. And I've got to say, one of the things that I don't like to admit to, but that I do before I go to bed to wind my brain down is I mm. play, uh, play Candy Crush. Yeah. And so when I had a look at your app and it's a similar style of thing, I thought, oh, this is great. I, could, I can have a look at this before I go to bed. Um, was, it, was that designed for sort of some stress relief or tell, tell us a bit about your app? No. So, you know, I, I think educating people about their health is incredibly important, right? That, that's how you sort of uh, move the conversation forward and get people healthier. That's how you get them to adopt uh, different lifestyle changes. And so you have to oftentimes meet people where they're at, right? People, I mean, as a doctor, I don't even like reading medical journals, you know? Um, and so one place that you can sort of meet people where they're at is with games and games are hugely informational. They're instructional. They influence the way that we think and the actions that we take. Um, and, you know, Candy Crush is incredibly popular. So I thought, well, why not create sort of a medical version of Candy Crush and have different levels that represent different diseases? Um, <clears throat> and throughout those levels, I can ask questions. And it's not meant to test people or to, to, to stress them out. It's really designed to so that they can easily learn. Yeah, I really enjoyed that, actually. I was swiping the... Uh, the healthy foods, not the candies, <laughs> and um, at, and learning little bits and pieces about the brain that I didn't know. So I, I was really enjoying that. But I, from a stress management point of view, I quite like that mindless. Um, there's something about that that I do find quite relaxing and helps me switch my brain off. So I was curious if that was part of, if, if it wasn't part of it, know that that's, that can happen too. Yeah, so the, what was part of it is really trying to influence people's subconscious mind, right, as opposed to trying to get them to focus and attend to something. Um, but, but to really influence somebody's behavior, it's through the subconscious. And that's how big companies market to us all the time, right, is they influence our subconscious. And so that, it was done with that in mind, right, because the reality is that the part of the mind that is most conscious is the subconscious mind and we tend to make most of our decisions from our subconscious mind yeah so are there other things that we could be doing to help our subconscious mind then well we can be very um mindful of the information that we're taking in right and so so i know for me i have to be very careful how much news i'm taking in right yep because news is always bad. <laughs> I know at the moment it's yeah, it's none of it's I, good. Look, I don't I don't want to be uh, you know mad at the world. You know I want to be able to sort of create the life that I want, and you know still stay up to date with what's going on, but not sit there for hours taking in the news. Right, so I'm very mindful of what I take in, what I take in through social media. Uh, I'm very be mindful about um, what I read right? Who I, I would consider to be mentors, who I spend my time around. All of that influences the way that our brains evolve. Um, so, uh, so I think being very mindful of the information that we take in is incredibly important. You know, I tell people all the time, look, your, your brain is never wrong, never wrong. Your brain will always come up with the right answer. 
the only thing that you know influences the right answer is the information that you give it. Right? So it's it's almost like a calculator. Every time you put it into a calculator, two plus two, you're going to get four, right? But what if that that two button was stuck? And instead of two plus two, it's giving you two 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 two. two. Then it's going to come up with an answer that you don't want. But it's not that the calculator is wrong. It's that you're putting in the wrong information. And the brain is the same way. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? From, and from that stress reduction, I mean, that's something that I've learned for my own thyroid health, it's just how important stress management yeah. is. And so you're right at the moment, like I think I've been spending way too much time on social media and getting worked up about stuff that I probably can't really change anyway. <laughs> Uh, and that's, I'm sure that's not doing anything good to my brain. So that's a, that's a good reminder. Yeah. You know, and it, it's really about just trying to find ways to minimize um, our stress because stress really is not good for the brain. Not only does it kill neurons, but it, it keeps us sort of in that sympathetic, um, really hyper state as if we're constantly facing a threat. And our bodies and brains are built for short-term stress, right? So like if a lion comes into this room that I'm in, right, that's going to be really stressful. And cortisol is going to go up. Adrenaline is going to go up. Part of cortisol going up is so I can focus on that lion, focus on the details, its posture, where it is in the room, right? So that way I can enhance my survival. But when cortisol levels are up for a really long period of time, that starts to kill neurons in the brain. When adrenaline is up for really long periods of time, you develop high blood pressure. Your heart rate goes up. All of that stuff leads to disease. And most people, at least in the United States, are chronically understressed. They're living as if there's a threat 24-7. Yeah, I don't think it's just the United States. I think Australia, I think we're pretty similar here too. (laughs) I think we're pretty similar. We live that high-paced, busy, yeah, yeah. under stress constantly. Yeah. Um, so I suppose I wonder, if, does that lead in to when we're thinking about, from a thyroid health point of view, long-term brain impact? Um, I don't know. It feels like I used to be smarter than I feel like I am now. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I felt like... Um, I don't know, my brain peaked when I was probably in my early 20s, finished uni, went to law school, did all of that. (laughs) You know, I felt like I was pretty smart then. I feel less smart now. I don't know if that uh, is true or not. I guess we'll (laughs) never really know that. But if we're managing our thyroid health well, should there be any long-term cognitive decline? Right. So if they're managed well, that shouldn't be the case. And the brain is capable of a tremendous amount of healing as long as you give the brain what it is that it needs. You know, I tell people, um, I'll tell people who are like in their seventies and eighties who come to me and they're starting to notice some memory issues. Act like you're in your twenties, right? When you're in your twenties, you are physically active. You're exploring different things. You want to travel the world. You're meeting different people that keeps the brain incredibly healthy. Lately, I've been saying, act like you're two. Because I feel like, I feel like, hey, three year olds know, like they're, they're constantly all over the place. They're exploring everything. They talk to everybody, right? All of that is really important. You know, meeting different people, listening to their perspectives is really important for brain health. Doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but listening to their perspective causes new neurons to form, new connections to form. Instead, we tend to be creatures of habit. Um, especially as we start getting into 30s, 40s, and beyond. And being creatures of habit kills our brains, kills our brains. Yeah, wow. Right? So I tell yeah. people all the time, I'm a big believer that we need to reinvent ourselves every few years. Like staying in one job your entire life, that is not healthy. Yeah, I, I've had a number of career changes, so I'm okay on that one. <laughs> so in a few years, I might be talking about something else. <laughs> But tough, you know, and you think, you know, for you, for example, you will have gone to university for a very long period of time to, there are people who have studied for long periods of time. It can be harder to change careers and jobs. But I think, I guess what you're saying is keep fresh, keep learning, keep looking for new opportunities. 
I guess that's where in normal times when we can travel, travelling is a great way of doing that, isn't it, and exploring new cultures and places. Absolutely. You get to see how different people live. You come up with different yeah. ideas. It also removes you from your life and the stress of your everyday life. So a lot of people will tell you that they tend to come up with new ideas for business ventures or whatever else when they're on vacation, mm-hmm. when they get to sort of take a step back right, and, and, and see the forest from the trees. Um, so travel is incredibly important. I remember a few years ago, I was in private practice. I was doing, it was a group private practice and I was doing really, really well. And there was a doctor who was uh, senior to me, who was 45. And I looked at him and I thought to myself, oh my God, is that going to be my life when I'm 45? Doing exactly the same thing I was doing then. And I was like, that, that can't be my life. I'm going to have to change and do things differently. And you know, not too long ago, I saw somebody who's like a memory he's a doctor who was a memory specialist. Like I remember attending one of his lectures and he was so knowledgeable about memory um, that I was like, I have, as a neurologist, I have no idea what you're talking about. So either, you know, you don't know what you're talking about at all because you can't communicate it to anyone or you're so into this that, you know, you, you really can't see the forest from the trees. Hmm. But then he, he comes to me because he retired and then he started having memory problems. Oh. The memory specialist was having memory problems. And it was because all he did for 50 years was research on memory. He never did anything else. He never allowed his brain to create new neurons, learn new skills, make new connections. And so now when that was gone, the dementia started to creep in. Wow, that's fascinating. So that neuroplasticity alongside the reducing stress. But there's hope. And I think that's what I love about what you've said is there's, there's hope. Yeah, there's, there's always hope. And, you know, one of the things that I often say is that what, what made, makes me a, a good doctor, at least I think I'm a very good doctor, <laughs> is that I've also been a patient since I was 18, right? And so I've gone through what a lot of my patients have gone through and I can relate. And one of the things that I often see is that people really identify with their diagnosis. And so in my course, I talk about, do we do a disservice by giving people a diagnosis, by giving them a label? Because then a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll research that label and start acting the way that they think that that label is supposed to act. And instead, that, that diagnosis is really just part of your story, right? There, there's completely different facets to who you are. And that's just part of your experience. And you can certainly use that part of your experience as a strength like you do by, by educating people and, and teaching them about um, the thyroid. But for a lot of people, they just say it to themselves, oh, no, I've got this. This is how I'm supposed to live. I'm not supposed to do anything with my life. And it, and it becomes a huge uh, disadvantage for them. Tell us a bit more about your course then. So the, so the course is called Take Charge of Your Brain in 30 Days. It actually launches uh, this coming Monday. Yeah, so it'll launch on... Uh, on September 7th in, in the U.S., so I guess September 8th for you guys. Um, and so the course is uh, about 70 lessons that are videotaped spread across four modules. And the first module is teaching people about why it's important to have a mission, vision, and purpose despite what their diagnosis is and how that um, is really important for your brain's evolution. The second module really speaks to all the things that influence your health and the impact that preventable chronic diseases have on your brain. The third module is is, uh, teaching people to become the leaders that their brains need them to be. Um, And they also learn about different neurological disorders. And the fourth module is about creating their own prescription plan, but one that is rooted in the development of mind, body, and soul. And to go along with these 70 plus lessons, Uh, they get uh, two hours worth of live group coaching sessions with me every week. So one hour on Monday, one hour on Thursday. The first hour is to go over content. The second hour is for Q&A. And even though the course is meant for the person to go through in 30 days, they actually have access to the course for one full year. 
Great. So they can go back over and, and listen to it again at any point in your time. Yep. And they can always jump in into the um, group coaching sessions. Excellent. And, um, and so where should people connect with you? And, find, you know, if they want, were interested in the course or just wanted to connect with you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, so they can do it through my Instagram page. So Philippe, uh, dot MD. So P H I L I P P E dot MD. Uh, they can also go, uh, to my website, uh, which is, uh, in the brain fit institute.com. So I N L E B R A I N F I T institute.com. Um, so those are probably the two best ways, or they can even email me at Philippe Dion at gmail.com. Awesome. And look, I'll put all those links in the show notes too, so that people can, can get in touch. Um, but look, just to wrap it up, Philippe, have you got three, what would be your three top tips for thyroid and brain health? So I would say, um, if you're on thyroid medication, you should probably take the thyroid medication. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> yep. You want, to, you want to keep your thyroid very well regulated. If you can get to the root cause of your thyroid issue, of what's causing the autoimmune response, even better. Um, I think you want to also exercise like we talked about, because exercise is so important for, for brain health. You want to make sure that you're eating really healthy, especially staying away from foods that may be triggering an autoimmune or inflammatory response. Um, and then you want to do other things like make sure you're getting enough sleep because sleep is meant for the brain. Um, that's the time when the brain not just rests, but actually does a lot of healing. Mm. And you want to minimize stress. Excellent. Well, that's, I think, five. You've got more, more for us than <laughs> Look, I think we're, this conversation has been full of lots of really practical tips and and um, and hope. I think yeah, I feel more hopeful about my own brain health as uh, as I'm moving forward. And you know, I think you've given me a lot to think about, but also a lot of practical things to do. So I really appreciate your time, and I know that you need to go to bed for your brain health because it's late over there. <laughs> so, but thank you so much for being. Um, you know, such a wonderful guest on the show today. Oh, well, thank you for having me. This, this was awesome. So thank you. The information presented and discussed in this podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease and should not be used as a substitute for proper advice from a qualified professional. 